Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Helen Carey. I work in the development and alumni relations team at the University of Birmingham, leading alumni engagement and fundraising with graduates who live in the United States. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to this very special conversation. We are joined by current students, alumni, friends and staff of the university, and this evening's discussion forms part of the UEB Festival. I'd like to make you aware that this evening will be recorded. Now the format for this evening will be a facilitated discussion between Michael and Professor Broom, followed by a Q&A. So if you would like to ask any questions, please do make sure to use the Q&A box to submit those. Now, this talk this evening does discuss mental health and well-being. If you have been affected by anything that might be discussed, or you feel you may be experiencing mental health challenges, you can find a range of support resources and contact information by the university's student well-being page. Okay, so to introductions, I am delighted to introduce you to Professor Matthew Broom, who will chair the conversation this evening. Matthew is an alumnus of Birmingham and an academic psychiatrist and director of the Institute for Mental Health, founded by University Investment in 2017. He is a leader in the field of early psychosis and in the philosophy and ethics of mental health and works clinically in the NHS in East Birmingham. Matthew is also the champion for Birmingham in Mind within the Birmingham in Action fundraising campaign to raise much needed funding to help better understand the youth mental health epidemic and explore effective treatments and support. Welcome, Matthew. Thank it is you. also, thanks Matthew. It is also my pleasure to introduce you to Michael Acton-Smith. Michael studied geography at Birmingham, graduating in 1996 and was awarded an honorary degree in 2013. Since graduating, Michael has gone on to incredible things and is currently co-CEO and co-founder of Calm. The Calm app has over 100 million downloads and provides content to tackle some of the most important mental health issues of the modern age, stress, anxiety, depression, and insomnia. Michael is also the founder of Firebox and founder of children's entertainment company, Mind Candy, the creators of Moshi Monsters. In 2014, Michael was awarded an OBE for services to the creative industries. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, delighted to be here. Uh, I'll hand to Matthew. Thank you so much. Thanks, Helen. Thank you, Helen. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. What I hope will be a, a really stimulating discussion for the next hour. Um, just to frame our discussion briefly before we get into the questions with, with Michael, um, as many of you here will, will know, youth mental health is an increasing uh, global concern. Uh, international research has demonstrated that 75% uh, of lifelong mental health problems begin before the age of 25. And we know that sadly in the UK, many young people can take several years to access the help they need. Um, at the University of Birmingham, we work very closely with young people with experience of mental ill health to help us to investigate the big issues in, in, in mental ill health and problems. Um, with the aid of our donors and with the Birmingham in Mind campaign, we are actively studying the causes of mental um, ill health in young people. Um, effective ways to treat mental health problems and also strategies to prevent and improve society to minimise uh, mental poor health in people. Um, one clear issue as I've alluded to really with the delays in people accessing care is the capacity of the NHS to provide the level of service that's required by many young people and how we can increase capacity and a crucial way of doing that is to think about digital um, support alongside or adjunctive to face-to-face -face personal contact and this is a really crucial area for mental health going forward particularly with the widespread adoptions of smartphones in 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 the developing world as well in addition to um, Europe um, and apps like Calm are a crucial part of this this offer in mental health to help support young people going forward so hence we're really delighted to have um, Michael with us today um, to help share his, his journey around, around the CALM application and also his conceptual developments around mental fitness as a concept and how that fits in with our festival theme of Be You and what that means to him. So um, we're very interested to hear from Michael about how he created CALM, his motivation for doing that and how it's um, so far to date in the future is fulfilling his mission statement to make the world a happier and healthier place. Welcome Michael, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, great to be here. Cool. Um, so we've got, um, as you know, a few a few questions we're going to we're going to go through before we open up to the, the floor to to um, ask you some questions themselves. Um, so the first question, which we touched on briefly, and we were we were chatting earlier, is this this idea of mental fitness. And you and I were 
roughly contemporaneous as, as alumni at the university. And so what, what looking back at that time, even undergraduate, what did mental fitness mean to you then as a, as a, as a student and perhaps how that concept has, has evolved for you over time? Yeah, I'd certainly never heard the word uh, when I was a student. It, it, it's quite a modern um, phrase. Mental health wasn't really discussed uh, when I was back at, at university. In, in fact, until recently, you know, five or six years ago, mental health was something that was swept under the carpet and um, uh, it was so stigmatized. And I think it's so extraordinary what's happened the last few years uh, where mental health is stepping out of the shadows and into the light. We can now talk about it. Um, and I think that is helpful for so many different people. So yes, we, we've come a long way in the last quarter of a, of a century. Um, and the way we think about mental fitness is, you know, one way of uh, sort of describing it is, is similar to physical fitness. You know, I, I love the book Shoe Dog, the story of Nike by, by Phil Knight. And back in the 70s, he would go jogging with a soft J and uh, it was this new thing. And uh, physical exercise wasn't really known to be good for you. Doctors thought it might be dangerous to, to do a lot of exercise. And obviously fast forward 50 years, we now know physical exercise is extremely good for us and, and very healthy. And I think we're seeing a similar wave developing around mental fitness. It is incredibly important to treat our minds with the same care and respect we do our bodies. The body and the mind are so interlinked. And, and so I think we're, we're at an early stage of, of this new wave, but uh, it's, it's important and uh, it's, um, yeah, it's vital for, for the health of everybody. The analogy with, with jogging and physical exercise is, is, a, is a really nice one. So I guess one would say that mental fitness could be seen as a part of one's essential timetable of structure of your, your normal life. Yeah, one, one way of thinking about it might be to uh, think of, in terms of the gym. You know, we go to the gym to keep our bodies physically healthy. We lift weights, we, we go on running machines, and there are ways we can keep our minds healthy, such as uh, being careful about the the amount of time we spend uh, on social media or absorbing um, news or uh, learning to meditate and you know, strengthening our awareness and, and resilience and, and other kind of um, uh, areas of emotional health. So um, what we do with Calm by teaching meditation, it's, it's a very valuable skill. It's not a, a silver bullet because there are other mental health conditions that, that need um, you know, psychiatrists and uh, other support in the way that if you had a physical ailment such as a broken leg, you wouldn't go to the gym, you would go to, to see a, a doctor at a hospital. So I think that's an important distinction to, to make. But yeah, few things are more important than looking after our, our minds because that is the frame through which we see the world. It impacts everything, our joy, our happiness, our relationships. And uh, yeah, it's why we think it's so important. Yeah, that's a really good way to phrase it actually. We kind of maybe neglected it perhaps a little in the 90s looking back. I think so. I think I can speak for myself when I was at university. M mental fitness and, and mental health wasn't top of my agenda. And I think it, it's a good point about, you know, going to university. It, it's kind of a perfect storm of threats to our, our mental health. And there's no wonder so many students are, are struggling and, and finding things difficult. Many are away from home for the first time. They're thrown into this very complex social environment. There's a, a lot of academic work to be done. Our sleep is reduced, so, so that impacts our, our health. And so it's, um, it's a very, very challenging time. And uh, um, yeah, as I say, no, no wonder it's, it's difficult for many people. Yeah, maybe to build on that on that point about being a student now and the challenges it brings. Obviously, things are further complicated with a pandemic around us, being dislocated perhaps from the campus slightly with, with um, distance learning. Um, any particular advice you, you think you could give to undergraduates now about elements of mental fitness that may be particularly helpful in, in the current climate? Well, uh, one that has been enormously helpful for me, one of the most valuable skills I've learned in my life is, is meditation. And uh, it sounds a little self-serving. Um, Calm is a great app, but there are many other ways to learn out there as well, um, to find a teacher and a style and a voice that, that you most resonate with. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions around it. I think one of the reasons it has taken such a long time for people to embrace it is because it was associated with religion or it was seen as a bit weird and out there um, counterculture. Um, what turned the light bulb on for me 
was when I read a lot of books about the subject and uh, I spoke to my co-founder, Alex Chu. I read some a lot of academic research papers and I realized that this is neuroscience. This is a way of rewiring the human brain and allowing us to show up in the world differently. And many, many benefits accrue from it. And, and one that I think is very valuable is that in all the stimulus that comes to us in, in life, when you have meditation practice, you're able a little bit more to respond instead of react. You know, the, the amygdala is like firing and it's why we say stuff we end up regretting. We fire off that email, we shout at our partner, we honk our horn in traffic. But a meditation practice can, as I say, allow you to have that tiny bit more space and you respond. You can still do all those things, but you're, you're more aware of that. And I think that makes a massive difference in how we go through life. So, so that's, uh, that's one suggestion. Again, not a silver bullet, but a, but a very valuable skill to, to add to the, the complexity of modern life. Thank you. Maybe we'll ask the team to get, you, get some recommended readings to share with the delegates. So thank you for that, Michael. Um, maybe if I can move on to the second question. So the, the theme for the Wellbeing Day um, as part of the UAB Festival is, is Be You. Um, mm. I guess it's a, a slightly a, a, a deep or tricky question, but what does that mean for you and get, I guess perhaps thinking you as an individual, how you've changed from that undergraduate to, to where you are now as a, as a CEO of a, a major company. Yes, yeah, I've been reflecting on this. And I think, you know, uh, when I was younger and I think for a lot of people going through teenage years and then going to, to university, you're not always your true self. You're, you're trying on, on different styles of, you're trying to figure out who you are in the world. Um, you're not always comfortable in your skin. And that's, a, a, that's not a great way to go through, through life. And I think what BU means to me is getting comfortable, being authentic, figuring out who you are and what is important to you and having that, that foundation, that, that rock, um, that you're not kind of blown along by a plastic bag every time you hear something new or get a, a different piece of, of information. So I think, um, I think that, yeah, being you is, is important. And there are so many, um, as I say, so many things going on in life. Mo modern life is, is complex and we can't control everything. And there's a great quote, I think it was by John Kabat-Zinn that said, um, you know, we, we can't stop the waves, but we can learn to surf. And I, I think that's a, a valuable way of, of thinking about this. We, there are many things that we can't do anything about and there's no point resisting and pushing against them, but getting comfortable with the things we, we can change. And I think that is, for me, um, one of the most valuable lessons I've, I've learned. Yeah, no, that make, makes sense. Sort of knowing which, which things you can adapt, which things you have to, you say, accept, perhaps move along. From. Just to just, yeah, let it go as, uh, yeah. as Frozen taught us. The, the yeah. animated musical. Um, and I guess you mentioned how helpful meditation has been for you personally. I'm sure, like many of us, your life is full of emails pinging and requests to join Zoom like, like this, 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 this evening. In, in the moment, I guess, how do you manage that feeling of, of stress and not being able to give enough attention or, me, or mental energy to every demand that's put, that's put upon you? Um, to yeah, cope with that feeling of frustration and burnout, perhaps? My previous business, I, I was, I felt like I was in a, a washing machine or a, a pinball. <laughs> there is so much happening, you know, hundreds of employees, millions of decisions to be made. And it's so easy just to get swept up. And I felt stressed all the time. I, I wasn't sleeping well. I wasn't eating well. I wasn't kind of taking good care of, of my physical or, or mental health. And uh, I think that uh, has changed dramatically. And as, as a leader, that's not a great way to be. You know, your team look to you to, to see, you know, what your reactions to situations. And I think the best leaders out there do have that strong foundation. They are calm in, in crisis. And so again, that is what meditation has, has helped uh, me do, give me more of a, a foundation to help me make better decisions, increase my resilience, um, my compassion, my empathy. And uh, so, um, and, and my awareness, I think this is, this is a really important point. We live in this age of attention. Attention is one of the most valuable resources. We have so many things competing for our attention and to be able to choose where and when and how and what we focus on is, is incredibly valuable. Um, so yeah, that having this, this skill has, I believe made me a, a better leader 
Um, it has made me a better friend, a, a better partner, um, and uh, yeah, impacted a lot of areas of my life in a positive way. Mm. One thing you mentioned about authenticity and sort of changing, trying on different identities as you as you were younger, Michael, just just chimes a bit with what some young people have told me over the years working in Birmingham, how they felt that, that kind of experimentation of adolescence, young adulthood was somewhat denied them because of being online so much and almost having a sort of social brand they wanted to maintain. I just, I mean, I, I completely agree with you, the experimentation and the uh, trying on different roles is really important. Um, do you think that's a genuine worry they have? Do you think we should encourage them to be a bit braver and a bit more experimental? Or is, is that something that uh, is hard with the fact we're so much being observed by our, our peers and friends at the moment? I think it is important to, to go through that period of, of life um, rather than just deciding this is what I'm going to be and, and sticking with that forever. So I, I think it is a healthy part of, of growing up. Um, and who's to say we shouldn't still do it when we're older, you know, just because we've grown out of our, our teenage years. Um, I think being thoughtful about who we are and, and being mature enough and emotionally intelligent enough to, to change uh, if, if we need to is really valuable and being flexible. So, yes, um, we shouldn't just be stuck in a, a rut for life. We should be yeah, open to changing if, uh, if we decide that makes sense. That's a really good point. It's quite a brave thing to do once you get to a certain age, I think, to, 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 to change the track you're on. Yeah, I, I think that plays as well to something else. Um, you know, we talked about mental health stepping into the light and people being more comfortable talking about it. I think this is connected with vulnerability as well. You know, Brené Brown and, and her talks and, and movement is important. Um, again, a lot of people would, would bottle up their emotions and, and feelings, but uh, being vulnerable, exposing ourselves, um, showing who we truly are, I think is incredibly uh, valuable to ourselves and, and those around us. Mm. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to ask you a little bit about the, the car map itself, if that if that's okay. Uh, okay, Michael. And um, you talked a bit about you know how you, some of the features of it benefited you personally. But you, what what inspired you, I guess, to go from what you'd found helpful to uh, something other people could, could benefit benefit from. Yeah, so I was running um, this wonderful company, Moshi Monsters, um, which is about as far removed as calm as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, a psychedelic, technicolor, weird and wonderful world of monsters for, for kids. And, you know, we grew to about 80 million users and it was just such an amazing journey. Um, created toys and books and magazines and movies. But we grew very fast and then we came down the other side very fast. I learned a valuable lesson of how kind of fast moving and fickle kids entertainment can be. And that was such a, a stressful time, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I wasn't sleeping well, I had headaches constantly, I was exhausted. And so I learned firsthand the damage that, that chronic stress can do and not looking after our mental health. So like a lot of sort of good entrepreneurial businesses, I, I scratched my own itch that that was, I went away on my own and I, I read a lot of books and academic research papers. I talked to a lot of people. And as I say, this light bulb went on and I realized that meditation is, is this extraordinary skill. And could we find a way of sharing it with the world? It had been, this practice had been around for thousands of years, but could we use new techniques and distribution and marketing, make it more accessible and relatable and simplified? Um, so more people could could benefit. And we think this is valuable for seven and a half billion people around the world. You know, nothing is more important than, than looking after our minds. The human brain is pretty complex, 90 billion neurons, trillions of connections, but it doesn't come with an instruction manual. And, and we don't really teach this to children in schools. We don't really teach it to adults. So I think this is a, a step in that direction to, to help us better understand our minds rather than be controlled by them. And uh, yeah, as I say, I think that's very valuable. Mm. One thing just, just interests me is getting you talking about your own journey around reading books and talking to a friend and maybe teachers. Mm -hmm. Obviously the, the, the intimacy and the solitude of meditation I guess I'm not, I'm not a technical person, so forgive me, to translate that into a, into a, a mobile application. Were there any particular challenges sort of conceptually or, or, or technically that, that, that your team struggled with in that? Yeah, very much so. So I set the company up with my very good buddy, Alex Chu. Um, we used to live together. We shared a house in Soho in London, which again was not very calm. <laughs> 
and uh, we'd play video games on the sofa talking about business ideas. And one day he mentioned um, that we there was a, a domain name we could buy, calm.com. And I was like, oh my goodness, what a brand we could build there. You know, this could be as big as Virgin or Nike or Disney or Apple. The world needed more calm. Um, and we started with a, a website and, and then we uh, figured out how to create an app soon after that, about 2013. But it was very slow going in the early days. One of the signals, you know, I think a lot of good businesses look for signals. Um, you look for sort of product market fit and minimal viable product before you invest too much. And Alex cobbled together a website called um, do nothing for two minutes.com, which, you know, not quite as catchy as calm.com, but you had to look at this screen of these waves and do nothing, not touch your keyboard or mouse for two minutes, and then you'd enter your email address. And people found that surprisingly difficult. And that was a, a signal for us that uh, there was something going on. So we we figured out how to create an app, cobbled cobbled it together, and then um, yeah, it grew very slowly for, for many years before we hit our tipping point. Mm. And we spoke. I guess predominantly about, about meditation, but are there any other features in, in Calm that you're particularly proud of or you think the users find um, very helpful? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, the, the core is the, the meditation. The, the, mm -hmm. One of the real amazing shifts for the business was when we launched the Daily Calm, which yeah. um, our incredible teacher, Tamara Levitt, um, uh, writes and, and narrates. And I think what's exciting about that is, you know, meditation is hard. Sitting still and um, calming your mind, um, and focusing on a constant like your breath is, is not easy to do. It does not come natural. <laughs> um, but creating something new, a story, something motivational and inspirational every day, having Tamara kind of coach you and walk you through it made a huge difference. And, and it helped people build that habit every single day. So, um, so that was, uh, that's a part of the app that um, we're very proud of. The next major step change was when we launched Sleep Stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, this wasn't obvious, but we, we saw something very interesting in the data a few years ago. There was this big spike of usage in the evenings, about 10.45 to 11 p.m. at night, people were listening to Tamara's meditations to help them fall asleep. And we thought, wow, what if we could create bedtime tales and uh, use um, sort of uh, soothing voices with music and sound effects and a sprinkling of magic um, and see if we could create something there. And they have been a massive hit. Uh, mm -hmm. About a quarter of a billion of those have now been listened to. Stephen Fry narrates one, Matty McConaughey, Harry Styles, Kate Winslet. Um, yeah, people love them. And um, it's kind of making going to bed sort of fun and a, a little bit entertaining. But then before you know it, we've, uh, we've knocked you out and you've fallen asleep before you've heard the end. <laughs> Excellent. I mean, the other thing I was thinking again as well, I mean, obviously we can spend a lot of our time working, being parents, caring for the members of our family. And having the app is also a bit of self-love, self-compassion as well, giving, allowing yourself a bit of time. I wonder if you think there's some sort of broader benefits of engaging with it that, around sort of recognizing the importance of yourself as an individual. Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's so important to the proverbial putting your oxygen mask on first in the in case of a, a disaster. We have to look after ourselves so we can look after others. Um, so yes, I think that's a very important part of calm. And, and it's not just about meditation and sleep. There are other sort of lighter touch elements. Um, even breathing is, <laughs> is valuable and important. And I find this myself, if I'm having a, a hugely stressful day and I don't have time to, to meditate, just stepping away from a screen or even sort of whatever I'm doing and taking a few deep breaths can slow the nervous system, can reduce inflammation, and cortisol and adrenaline. And it's extraordinary how that can kind of just almost act like a sort of reset of a computer. So you reboot again, feeling slightly differently. So um, I think we've often overlooked these very simple <laughs> tools that, that help us as human beings because they almost feel too simple <laughs> um, in this world of technology and, and complex solutions, but they are incredibly important and valuable. Thank you, Michael. Um, I mean, obviously, it's, it's, it's a difficult time. You've obviously been in this in this pandemic period for, for for ten months now. I'm not sure how much you track how users use various different features. But have you seen a shift in how Calm has been utilised, either by the features or by the demographics, perhaps? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, stepping back a, a little bit, when we set up around uh, 2012, 2013, people thought we were crazy. <laughs> they would back away from us at parties, the, the weird meditation app guys. 
Um, and slowly the, the sentiment started to change. And then 2017 was the, the really big tipping point where more and more people started to, to get it. Um, but then uh, the start of the pandemic, you know, March last year, it, it just went to a whole new level. And, you know, we, we recognized the work that we were doing was helping so many different people. We created a, a resources page called Calm Together of um, free tools and uh, um, audio recordings from, from Calm. Um, and the biggest uh, uptick um, we was on the business side. A lot of companies reached out to us looking for simple but valuable solutions for their remote, remote workforce. And uh, yeah, hundreds of new companies have signed up um, to Calm this uh, last year, which uh, I think has been fantastic because I think it's so important employers uh, look after the mental health of, of their teams. Yep. I think we might come to it perhaps in the, in the Q&A. I'm certainly aware of some uh, businesses I work with are trying to sort of schedule that into the into the daily routine a bit more with their, with their workforce. And again, making it part of, of uh, yeah, employment as well as education. And, you know, it's a really interesting point. Just a few years ago, I think the idea of bringing mindfulness into companies uh, would have been laughed out of the boardroom. You know, the, I, the, the typical CEO might have seen it as a waste of time or envisaged uh, a group of employees sitting around singing or chanting on cushions <laughs> instead of working. And I think what's important is this shift that's happened in society where people now get it, the penny has dropped, that this is actually really valuable for people. It's not only is it good for the, for the business to have a workforce that is more resilient, uh, able to manage their stress, sleeping better, emotionally intelligent, look at connecting with their employees, but it's just the right thing morally to do as well, to, to look after our, our teams and make sure they are healthy. We, you know, the trend of bringing um, uh, physical fitness and gym memberships into companies happened a little earlier. And uh, I think it's wonderful that it's now happening with mental fitness. Yeah. And as I mentioned in the introduction, we're very interested in, in preventative strategies. So as well as people with established mental illness, what can be done on a large scale to, to prevent these things getting any worse? And which, this is definitely part of that uh, armory, I think, to help uh, stop things getting any worse for some, some poor people. Yeah. Yeah, so true. Cool. Um, so the, the sort of final area I wanted to ask is your, is your mission statement, really. And just to sort of check that with you and how you think you are going with that and where you think you're going next so it's i think the opening quote we gave at the beginning so calm's mission is to make the world a happier and healthier place so tell me yeah where you think you are with that and in terms of achieving it in terms of other metrics or in terms of a more general feeling you have of how it's been picked up we talked a lot about how it's been used in the pandemic more yeah yeah so it's quite a broad mission statement um but it's something we're very passionate about and and proud of and we think, you know, in the way that Nike has built this hundred billion dollar plus business um, on the boom in physical fitness, we want to do the same for mental wellness and, and mental fitness. We think this could be one of the defining brands of the 21st century. You know, again, we, we used to say that a few years ago and people thought we were a little bit crazy, <laughs> um, but it's starting to, to happen. Um, you know, 100 million downloads is, is good, but that's still, you know, barely 1% of the world's population. Uh, we have 4 million paying subscribers. And we have a lot of very passionate um, users, you know, whenever we're having a difficult day and, and getting stressed and struggling, uh, we go into the app and the app store and look at the, the reviews. We've had about a million five-star reviews and it's just incredible to see the spread of humanity. Um, some of the stories just are goosebump inducing. Everything from little children using Calm to cope with bullying at school or to help them get a good night's sleep to families using Calm at end of life in nursing homes to celebrities using it to cope with the stresses of going on a world tour um, to marriages being saved to drug addiction, people suicidal. I mean, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. So, so we feel that the work we're doing is, is very, very important, but um, there's still an awful long way to go. So the, the digital side is, is very important, but then as I say, we wanna build this brand. We wanna find other ways to bring calm into people's lives. And so could we take the brand offline? Could we create calm tea or clothing? Or, um, you know, we've, we've done a series of books with Penguin. One of my favorite projects is to possibly buy an island and create Calm Island, the world's most relaxing resort. Um, a little impractical at the moment, but uh, that might be fun to, to do one day. <laughs> Excellent. And I guess another area that's been 
features highly in, in the sort of mental health literature about the pandemic is around social disconnection and loneliness yes. is, 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 is I guess obvious on one level and I wondered whether that is something you were looking at with with your, your colleagues in Calm about trying to manage social connections as, as a route to, to, to mental health or to, or to mitigate the harms of, of uh, poor mental health. Yeah, it, it's a very, very important issue. Loneliness is, is hugely damaging to, to our health. There are many, many studies um, showing this. And I think there are two aspects of it at this current time. That there's the isolation that we are experiencing because physically, because we're, we're not able to, to connect or hug or, or see our friends or, or colleagues. Um, but there's another type of, of, of isolation which technology can help with, which you know th we are connecting here through, through technology. It's not the same as being in the same room, but it's still valuable. And so emails and Slack and WhatsApp do help us bridge that gap a little bit and, and reduce some of that kind of isolation and, and disconnection. And I think this is a, you know, this leads on to another point, which is important, big tech, mobile phones, um, screens, social media gets a lot of kind of criticism in, in the modern age, but it's really tools that, that we have for us and we, we can use tools for us or against us. And so this is why I think a meditation practice is valuable because it helps us understand how we use these devices and these, these apps so we can do them, use them for us and, and help us rather than against us. So we can mindfully use our phone rather than mindlessly whipping it out and scrolling through it and losing three hours and wondering what on earth just happened, <laughs> which, which I'm, I have been guilty of and I, I'm sure we all have, but um, trying to be a little more kind of conscious of how I use my uh, incredible devices and technology. Yes, you know, I was thinking as you were talking about how to have a, an offline calm, I mean, there's, there are, we did an event with um, um, some colleagues in European universities about youth mental health and how to support that, you know, with recession and um, some absent educational and employment opportunities. And one of the things that occurred to me that we know can be quite useful is, is volunteering and doing altruistic acts. You can kind of see how a digital solution could kind of prompt you to real world activities that might be beneficial, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, I guess one last thing before you move to the Q&A, Michael, if, that, if that's okay, just to take you back to your um, undergraduate self. Mm. And if you could advise the 18-year-old Michael about mental fitness then, um, what, what would you have said to him? Or would he have listened, I guess, is the other, is the other important question. That's a great question. I'm not sure I'd have listened. I'd have probably run off down to Old Joe's and uh, met up with my friends um, and uh, had a big night drinking. Um, uh, what advice I would give? I, I think, um, again, I, I could have tried to have told myself how important, you know, meditation was or getting a good night's sleep was, but, but again, I, I'm not sure it would have stuck because I had so many, the world was so new and exciting. There were so many different things to do. Health wasn't really that, that much of an issue. Um, so I don't know whether that would have actually been useful because, you know, I, I've, I've done a lot of things in my life. I've, I've made some missteps and mistakes and had some disastrous businesses, um, but I've also, through those errors and mistakes, learnt and, and uh, become stronger and, and wiser. And so I, I wouldn't regret any of those kind of dead ends I, I've been on because it's yeah. helped make me who I am. And uh, yeah, just uh, helped me learn along the way. Yeah, and that's an important lesson, I guess, in itself, that mistakes happen and to, to carry on. Definitely. but. But yeah, you've made me reminisce about my wonderful time at, at Birmingham. As I say, what, what a great university. I met some of my, my best friends came from um, Birmingham, Tom Boardman and Matt Schoen and, and many, many others and joined so many great societies. And uh, yeah, I haven't been back in ages. So I think today has prompted me to um, have, a, have a, a revisit once we're allowed out of our houses. <laughs> we'll be very we're delighted to host you at any, any point when we yeah, can have guests. That'd be really good. Um, so I think that's the kind of preset questions we, we have, Michael, if, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, and thank you very much for answering those so so fully and so thoughtfully, I guess, as well. Kind of the, you know, fairly personal things you've been asking you, so I appreciate your honesty with that. Um, so I think we're gonna open some questions from our colleagues here. Um, and I think the first question is from Charlotte Minter, who's our welfare and community officer for the, the Guild of Students. And I think Charlotte's happy to ask that question herself, Charlotte. Yes, hi, uh, thank you, Matthew, and hi, yes. Michael. Um, and now, yeah, I think you definitely touched on this earlier, but I just wondered, um, 
to what extent do you think that the rise in self-help apps reflects an individualistic approach to mental fitness and well-being and shifts the focus away from looking out for others? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think as we were touching on earlier, it is important to, to look after ourselves and our own mental health and physical health. You know, no one is responsible for that other primarily down to us. Um, so I think developing a, a meditation practice is healthy. I think that the downside to it might be is if it makes you uh, just focused on yourself. One of the great things I think meditation does is it, it helps us connect with other people. It improves our empathy, our compassion. It makes us more aware of those around us. We think more thoughtfully when we're engaging in discussions and, and arguments with others. So I think the net benefit is, is hugely positive for society. It's one of the reasons why we're so passionate about uh, teaching mindfulness and, and meditation in schools to, to equip children with these incredibly valuable skills. You know, if you want to change the world, you start with the youngest generation. And uh, I think um, it's, uh, it's a very valuable uh, tool. Um, and the final thing I'd, I'd say is, you know, one of the best ways to learn these skills is with a teacher in a physical space, you know, one-to-one, -one. but that doesn't scale very well. That's expensive. There aren't enough teachers around the world. So I think apps are the next best uh, way to do it because we always have our devices with us and uh, billions of people around the world have them. Great. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Michael and Charlotte. Um, so our next question is from, from Christian. Are you okay to ask, ask this question, Christian? Uh, yeah, that's that's no problem. Um, yeah, thank, you. thank you very much for the talk. Um, it's great to hear you say that it's important for employers to support their staff with mindfulness. Um, in answering that last question, you also said that mindfulness is ultimately a personal matter. So I'm a recent graduate now working in financial services, and I'm quite curious how much you think mental well-being is a purely individualistic issue, um, whether the onus rests on employers to support their staff or whether it comes down to the staff to actually push for bottom-up changes in the culture and working practices of their company? Yeah, it's not a, it's not a straightforward question to, to answer. I, I think it's taken a while for employers to get on board with it because um, given that we are in a capitalist society, they will need to see the ROI uh, from an investment. But I think what's happening is that is becoming obvious. Um, who doesn't want uh, a team and a workforce that is, is sleeping well and has high EQ and is resilient? And so I think the, the academic research that has happened over the last sort of decade or two is, is showing employers that, hang on, this, this makes a lot of sense. It'll, it'll not only make the business healthier, it'll make our workforce healthier. So I think when those two things come together, that is the, the perfect storm. And that's why we're seeing such dramatic growth in, in companies offering. Um, to your point about bottom up, I think if, if companies are not offering it, then employers should ask. And um, I think what's happened in the last few years, it's almost becoming table stakes in a lot of very forward thinking workforces. Many uh, millennials joining companies and interviewing are asking, what are your physical health benefits? What are your mental health benefits? And, and so employers uh, are definitely taking note of that. Okay, great, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Christian. Um, I think I have a, a couple of questions um, to put to you, Michael, from the audience. Then we have another live question from a colleague. So um, this question's from Anisha. Um, how do you not treat, how do you deal, sorry, with not treating mental well-being as a chore and embracing it? Days can get so busy with studying, it's very hard to make time for something that isn't always tan tangible. It's true. It's true. I, I run calm and I still struggle to, to find time to meditate. I do it most, almost all days, but, but not every single day. You know, I think it's the same with anything, that anything that's beneficial and, and valuable to us takes work. It, it takes commitment. It, it takes planning. Um, we don't, you know, build a, a healthy, strong body just by thinking about it or by accident. It, it, it takes that work. So what we would say, though, is that, you know, meditation practice doesn't need to be hours every day, um, doesn't need to be done in a certain place or wearing certain um, outfits. It can be as little as, as 10 minutes a day. And to that point earlier of the daily calm, that makes it a little bit more interesting and, you know, um, 
are easy to, to fit into your day. Uh, one thing we talk about is kind of anchoring a healthy practice like meditation with something else you do instinctively. Um, you know, after you shower in the morning, before you have breakfast, before you leave the house, that can help it um, establish it as a, as a healthy habit. And there's some great books written on this by, you know, Charles Duhigg and, and others about how to establish healthy habits in your life. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, so a, a question from one of our um, postgraduates, Michael. So a question from, from David. He's going to start a PhD in the next weeks. Any advice on how not to lose his mind is he's asking. <laughs> wow, well, um, goodness. I think, you know, one thing is, is to think about the, the end game of that journey you know why why are you doing this and and all the positive emotions that, that will flow from that to, to give you that north star to, to get you through i think it's similar when starting a business it's overwhelming it's terrifying you've got this multi-year journey to go on and it could be so overwhelming you don't even take that first step but to be excited about the change you want to make in the world that you know the ipo you might do one day so i think whatever the the analog is that for for um the phd i think would be a, a good starting point um and then just being being thoughtful about how you spend your time you know not going too deep so every minute is spent on it so you risk burning out building time into your schedule to, to do other things that that you love keeping that healthy balance um, I think those uh, could be valuable. And again, I sound like a, a broken record, but uh, possibly trying to develop a meditation practice to, to help um, to sort of strengthen your mind for, for when things get really, really uh, tough on the journey. If I could respond to David, if that's okay, Michael, as well. I mean, one of the things, David, that um, certainly the, the funding bodies who fund PhD studentships want to see that, um, you know, we're looking after students well and, and things like Michael mentioned, fitting in meditation, yoga, um, you know, not responding to emails after certain hours of the day are all important practices to, to get in, I think, into academic academic work. Um, excellent. So I think our next question is, is a live question from Chinny, who's going to kindly ask for us. Chinny, is that OK? Yeah, good evening. Thank you again, Michael. Um, so my question is, I'm a recent political science graduate um, and I'm interested in things like tech and app based. Um, and I was wondering how you kind of made that switch over from geography to something more tech based. Um, you know, what were the steps you took and because I'm not really sure how slash where to start. Yes, yeah. So I loved my my geography degree, but it it's not all of it is 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 relevant for running a, a tech company. Um, other than you know the, the the ways I was taught about critical thinking and some of the kind of foundations you learn when when you go to, to college, for me um, I think what helped was um, I was a, a voracious reader of anything I could get my hands on from the, the tech world. So there are some amazing um, books out there uh, from people who've built uh, big uh, tech companies. Um, and then uh, I can share some sort of notes afterwards, but um, there's a the story of WeWork is, is fascinating. It's a cautionary tale, but, but you learn uh, a lot about that journey. Um, Minimal Viable Product, The Lean Startup by Eric Ries is, is fascinating uh, when you're starting to think about your first um, business. Reading blogs like, you know, Recode and, and TechCrunch are valuable to see uh, how other companies are, are doing it out there. So uh, it's a long-winded way of saying, you know, the, the best place to start is just marinating yourself in all the, the things you can read. Um, speak to anyone you can. Once the world opens up, go to, to tech events and, uh, and then bit by bit you start connecting the dots and uh, it allows you to spot opportunities when they uh, emerge. The final thing I'd say is Feel free to start a startup on your own. It's it's scary and electrifying, um, but also a really smart route is to join uh, a startup that's growing and kind of learn in that environment. And then when you're ready, uh, uh, step up, step off to, to do your own. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We've got a few, a few more questions coming in thick and fast, if, that, if that's okay to me to ask you a few more. Um, yes, yeah, so the next one is from um, Tom Micklewright, and his question is, and we've touched on this slightly, but what is the future of meditation and of calm? And is it uh, a matter of improving access to meditation training, 
are there opportunities for us to do more with it? Um, say the last part again, sorry. What was... um, so uh, is it a just a matter of improving access to meditation training? Which I guess is, is what we've been you've done with the digital um, platform to access it. Yeah. Or are there more opportunities for people to do more with it? I think that's probably both the application calm and perhaps the meditation itself, maybe? Got it. Yes. So the, the first part of the question, the future of calm, you know, as, as I mentioned, we, we think we feel like we're just getting going. As Jeff Bezos says about Amazon, it's still day one. <laughs> and um, there's so many more people for us to, to reach. Uh, and one of the ways we can do that, which connects to the second part of the question, is to further reduce the, the stigma to, to normalize this practice. You know, hundreds of, well, millions of people have embraced it already, but, but most people haven't. And one of the ways we've been doing that is we've taken a leaf out of the Nike playbook to, is to work with celebrities and talent that have huge audiences. And by coming out and saying that, you know, they use calm or they meditate or mental health is important, that makes it much more normal and accessible for everybody else. So LeBron James was a great example there. You know, one of the world's greatest basketball stars uses calm every day in the afternoon. Um, and so I think that that helps hugely. And again, other everyone from politicians to, to rock stars um, are, is, are helping spread the message. Thank you, Michael. So the next question is one that I think several colleagues have asked. It's again a fused question, if, if that's okay. And again, very topical to the, the times we live in, really. And um, about, I guess, the heroic work teachers are doing to keep uh, educating our, our young people. So the question is, how, how do you think we could support teachers and pupils who are homeschooling? And how can we help them maintain their mental resilience and fitness? Yeah, such an important question. I, I feel for anyone homeschooling <laughs> and, you know, teachers who have had to, it's hard enough teaching in a classroom, learning all these new skills, getting comfortable with the technology in such a short space of time is, is a massive task. Um, one thing we have tried to do at Calm, several years ago, we launched our Calm Schools program and we offered Calm free to, to all the teachers in the world. And it was so popular, um, it actually took the, the site down. We had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of requests. And just recently, about two weeks ago, we launched a new Calm Schools program where we provide a lot of um, mindfulness uh, techniques and um, lesson ideas uh, for teachers that is free to access on the Calm site. So again, none of this is a, a silver bullet, uh, but it, it can all help uh, a little bit. Um, even starting uh, you know, a lesson with 10 seconds or 30 seconds or a minute of, of silence or calm just to collect everybody's thoughts can, can be valuable. And then teaching kids um, this valuable skill. Um, again, not straightforward to do because kids do not want to sit still, <laughs> but um, there, are, there are ways and techniques and, and advice that, that we, um, we've been sharing. Super, thank you, Michael. Um, so a question from uh, an, an anonymous delegate. Um, so how do you balance your own mental fitness when your product is a tech-based product um, application and there might be a greater demand for staying up to date with social media and the online world? So I wondered if that's whether having the phone in your hand opens you up to other distractors or attention grabbers as we may be touched on, touched on earlier. Yes, yeah, another important question. We get asked this a lot by, by journalists. You know, the, the world is stressed because of our phones everywhere and then here comes calm saying use your phone to de-stress so <laughs> the irony is not lost on us and I think the answer is, is similar to what I said um, before the, these the, the technology is not the problem it's it's how we use it it's how we interact with it it, it can be incredibly powerful and, and valuable for us if we are careful and thoughtful and mindful about how we use it and so developing that practice to be more conscious of, of when and how and, and where we use our, our phones is, is vital. On the other side of that screen are thousands of people optimizing and tweaking every single element to make sure you stay, you know, checking one last time the, the sort of the slot machine um, mentality. And I'm sure we've all seen, I think it's the social dilemma on, on Netflix. So the way we can arm ourselves uh, against that to, to give us a little more control is to develop, you know, a, a mindfulness practice. Mm. Thank you, Michael. I think I think it was Zadie Smith. I read, I read. I think an author who 
sort of hobbles her own laptop. She puts on some uh, <laughs> program that stops her going onto the internet for X hours a day, so she can just focus on making the laptop a, 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 a typing machine, I guess. Yes. I just wondered, in terms of mindfully using a device, do you yourself use any kind of features that shut down elements of technology at all? Yeah, there are many out there and, and they're very successful. I check my screen time every week to, to see how much I'm, I'm using. I, I don't actually use any, any blockers or things like that. I try, I'm not always successful, but I try and catch myself when I'm going into, you know, a Twitter or Instagram kind of <laughs> loop. Um, and uh, um, one thing I do do is I, I do not turn my phone on in the morning when I wake up. I try and have at least half an hour to just kind of uh, sort of come out of, of sleeping. Um, if I Sometimes I try and sit down with a pen and paper um, because I think I read a stat the other day, something like 60% of people, the first thing they do when they wake up is reach for their phone <laughs> and then they're checking what's going on in the White House. They're checking how many likes their last Instagram post got and suddenly your brain is you know, fizzing with, with all these other things. So um, being conscious of things like that are very valuable. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I think I wake up to all these BBC and CNN notifications. I'm sure it's not a great start. Yeah, it's so true. I'm just sharing the Calm Schools um, resources link in the, in the chat if anyone wants to check it out. Oh, thank you so much. I'll ask the team if they can put that out to the whole um, de de delegates. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, so a question, I think you've got time for, for one or two more. So if that's okay with you, Michael, um, a question from Maria. Um, in line with the physical health exercise um, analogy discussed earlier. I think it's when you talk about Nike and, and jogging. Is there such a thing as over-exercising for mental fitness? And in this, she's kind of defining it over-exercise in, in the physical sense is associated with adverse effects, a variety of adverse effects. So I guess that's the question. Do you think there's there's too much mental fit, fitness that could have harms to one's mental health? You know, that's a really a really intriguing question. And I think with almost anything in life, too much of a good thing can then become a bad thing. <laughs> we, we have to be thoughtful, balance in, in everything we do is, is important. So I would say if, if, um, if you are spending, you know, um, uh, a, a very large part of your day kind of meditating, it, that, that may be um, keeping you away from other things in, in your life. If, um, if you're meditating and, and you're struggling and it's just a constant battle, you know, stepping away from it, I think would be would be valuable. Um, I think it's a, a tricky question that I think would be usefully asked maybe of a, a psychologist or a, or a therapist. I wonder if you have a, a perspective on, on that, Matthew, um, whether too much yeah, mental fitness can be damaging. Um, I suppose, yeah, I don't, I think that's probably where one of the analogy might get a bit, doesn't, you know, follow through. I think a lot of these practices can be very helpful, independent of amount on one level. I guess I'll probably go back to our discussion earlier about relationships and, and isolation. So mm -hmm. I think there's the individual practices which we talked a bit about today in terms of meditation and, and, and looking after one's sleep. I think also there's about being with, um, you know, trusted friends and good relationships and doing things in the outside world. And perhaps, as I, as I mentioned, in, in uh, thinking with European colleagues about, about how to benefit mental health, about issues around volunteering and, you know, hobbies and activities. So I think in relation to Maria's question, I think, yes, it's a balance of both individual um, type activities that can help one's mental health, as, which Michael's very you know, helpfully gone through today. Also thinking about um, shared activities. And again, that could be something that Calm could help coordinate, I guess, as, as we've touched on. So I think that would be where I would probably think is the only tipping point to make sure you have a balance of, of both of those in, in one's mental health. Mm -hmm. And again, when I talk to patients, I quite often talk about sleep, exercise, mindfulness, also about spending time with those you trust and, and who are helpful to you in life. Yeah, I wonder, building on that for a second, I wonder whether the question is alluding to possibly overthinking or, you know, obsessing. I think one of the problems many people get into um, is, is rumination, doing the, getting stuck in that rut, that same loop again and again. And a little bit of anxiety is, is a good thing. You know, it, it helps us um, get out of bed in the morning to, to achieve and, and move forward. But, but too much, as many of us get stuck in, is it, that's when it gets dangerous. And so being conscious and aware of, right, I'm doing too much rumination, too much overthinking here. Is this helpful to continue going over that same issue is, is something important to ask oneself. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, 
Okay, so a, a question from uh, an anonymous attendee. Um, this is about, I guess, building up your, your business and the application, Michael, so a bit more maybe related to your entrepreneurship and your, your industry. Um, so if we go back to the start of Calm, how mm. long did it take to build your team? And what advice would you now give to your past self? So I think this is your, 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 your pre-Calm or your originating Calm self, perhaps. Yeah, it, it was very tough in the early days. Like any, I'm sure there are a lot of entrepreneurs um, on this Zoom today. It's really tough in the early days. Most businesses fail. Most people think you're crazy. Um, and we really struggled to, to hire people. Um, we found it very difficult to raise uh, money. Um, and so we just had to get our head down. And fortunately, I had a co-founder in Alex Chu. So we were able to kind of G each other along and uh, um, kind of share the, the workload. And yeah, it took several years before um, it really started to take off and, and become uh, a lot more um, obvious. I mean, this is a question that I think we mentioned leadership earlier, actually. Getting a good team is, is, is not easy. Do you have any, what do you say, quick tricks or, or, or intuitions that guide you in, in recruiting a team you think will, can be successful for you? It's, it's vital. And it's, you know, we, we spend about, um, Alex and I, even now, we're about almost 200 employees. We spend about half our time on recruiting. Yeah. Um, you know, interviewing, sourcing, researching, um, because it, it's everything that Calm is, is the team that, that is, is building the product. Um, so yeah, we, we take it very, very seriously. And um, we, we, for many of our roles, we have thousands and thousands of applications for, for one person we're gonna hire. So it takes, it's, it's a very long and um, important process that we go through. And I've, I could talk for hours about this, all the tips and the techniques. There's a great book called Why, um, oh no, sorry, Who, which is famous in Silicon Valley. Uh, all around recruiting and, and hiring. And uh, I'd highly recommend that for anyone building a team. Mm, good advice. I'll look into that. I think, Michael, thank you. Probably on your bookshelf somewhere behind you in that uh, No, in that. sadly not. But yeah, I'll get hold of it. Um, so I think we can probably go to our last question now, if that's okay, Michael, and where we've, we've worked you jolly hard. So thank you. So this question's from, from Chloe. Um, how do calm employees practice mental health, mental fitness whilst working virtually? Have you introduced some behaviors or approaches to work that support the calm vision internally? Mm. Yes, yeah, so we're growing very fast. We all work incredibly uh, intensely, but I don't think we'd be living up to our mission if, if we were kind of uh, burning everyone out. So we, we, we try and be very thoughtful about the work that we do at Calm. We, in the middle of the pandemic, we decided to become a remote first company. Um, so even after it's over, we want people to work wherever and however, and um, uh, however they want. Um, before the pandemic, we had a daily calm every morning where some of the team would gather and uh, do 10 minutes of, of meditation as, as a group. Um, that was, uh, uh, I think, a really important part of our culture. Um, then we've just done a, a lot of little things, you know, checking in with our teams regularly, giving a stipend to encourage people to, to buy comfy chairs and lighting and make sure the home setup is good. We introduced uh, uh, several mental health days um, last year, which were incredibly popular, you know, usually on a Friday where we say to the team, you know what, um, we're not going to work today, um, do whatever you want. And unsurprisingly, everyone loved it. <laughs> and uh, again, it, it's difficult to do because there's endless things all of us are doing. But sometimes taking a little baby step backwards enables you to take many steps forward and everyone comes back on Monday, super recharged and refreshed and often with lots of kind of energy and new ideas. So I'd encourage, I think that'd be a great thing for more companies to do, especially in a remote world, to take uh, more, to be comfortable taking more of the occasional day off. That's great. Thank you, Michael. That's a good tip for the University of Birmingham as well to implement maybe <laughs> going forward. Um, so I think we'll close the, the formal Q&A there. And many thanks, um, I guess, firstly to all the attendees coming along tonight and to answering, um, to taking part in the discussion and asking so many great questions. Apologies, we couldn't get them get them all through. I can see 73 on the, the so, Q&A uh, indicator. What I would say, sorry to interrupt, Matthew, yeah, is no, I, I'm, um, if anyone wants to ask any questions on Twitter, I'm at Acton, A-C-T-O-N. So um, yeah, feel free to fire questions there and I'll do my best to answer. Oh, that's really generous of you, Michael. Thank you so much. And yeah, obviously my final thank you is a, a massive one to Michael Acton Smith for joining us this evening, giving up his time so so generously and thoughtfully, and indeed offering more time later on to ask uh, 
answer, answer people's questions here and um, for your insights, speaking so openly, Michael, about your own stress around the transition between companies and developing the app for your own uh, insights and what was helpful for to you. Um, our alumni community is incredibly valuable to all of us at the university and we're very grateful so much to Michael particularly for giving up his time this evening for us today. Thank you very much, Michael. Well, thank you. Thank you for the thoughtful. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was a great interview. Cheers, everybody. Yeah, really good thank to talk you. with you, Michael. Thank you both so very much. And thank you again to everybody for joining us and for your insightful and interesting questions. I know Matthew's already said it, but there were well over 70. So I'm sorry for those that we weren't able to get to. And Michael, your Twitter's going to be on fire after this. So uh, thanks very much for sharing that. I and I thought... This is the most um, well-attended Zoom I've, I've done uh, in a year in the pandemic. So yeah, well done, Birmingham University. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Michael. And I think I, I just wanted to reflect on one of the points you made early on about this being the age of attention. And I mean, I'm just so grateful that we've taken this moment as uh, guests, as alumni community, as students to kind of focus and listen, because I think it, it's so important that we do that for ourselves. Um, and, and thank you, Michael, again, for, for bringing us together and Matthew for sharing such a fascinating conversation. Um, I also just wanted to say that if this evening has inspired anybody to find out more about the research that Matthew and his incredible team are doing at the Institute of Mental Health, then please feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, my email address is gonna appear in the chat. Or alternatively, if you uh, check the event email that we'll send you in your follow-up, um, there will be more information about the fundraising campaign for Birmingham in Mind, and where Birmingham researchers and clinicians are working be to better understand the causes of anxiety and depression. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and we also would really appreciate your feedback on this event. So please do complete the short survey that will appear in the chat soon. And just to thank you once again for being with us this evening, for your questions, your contributions, and to Matthew and Michael for bringing us all together. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful day, everybody. <laughs>